week when Colleen, a um, police officer, was driving on duty and was hit by a distracted vehicle. She woke up surrounded by what looked like white sheets, which were actually the deployed airbags. When the firefighters arrived on scene, they stated that the accident looked like a fatal. It took 17 minutes for the firefighters to cut Colleen out of the vehicle, but she survived and they attribute her survival to the door and the current airbags. My name is Julianne Cedar. I'm Peter Wynn. I'm Scott Lilly. My name is Joaquin Durant. And today we're going to discuss the potential fulfillment takeover in Nissan and the future plan of AutoLeap, the worldwide leader in automotive safety. This is our agenda where we're going to go over today. First, we're going to go over the problem and position statement, move on to the qualitative analysis, then the quantitative analysis, and wrap up with recommendations. I'm going to hand it over to Scott to do the problem and position statement. So what kind of prompted all of this conversation that we had was this Nissan thing. So a little bit of background on that. So Nissan is a manufacturer, meets with their suppliers, uh, tries to brainstorm new ideas, uh, does something called the Kaizen Burst, where they create all these new efficient processes. And that's really important because it's great people, it's great quality products, and it's great processes that make uh, you know products that save people's lives, just like home. So uh, our problem statement. Uh, we wanted to talk about uh, AutoLeave's response to this tanks event, uh, what they should do about um, Nissan wanting to be in more control of their own fulfillment, as well as future proofing and planning. What does the next five years look like? What does the next 10 years look like? Uh, vehicles are getting smarter and much safer, and AutoLeave definitely needs to be uh, keeping up with that as well as the question of what to do with the Olive Branch facility in Mississippi. There's four years left in that lease, and that gives uh, some questions to Autoliva as to what they should do, uh, expand it, or change location. So our position after doing our analysis is uh, that Nissan can't afford to reduce uh, their costs and mitigate the risks that Autoliva faces uh, by running their own fulfillment. Uh, as a whole, they can reduce touches in the whole supply chain, which is going to decrease costs and be a win-win for both organizations and everybody involved, as well as AutoLeave needs to really look into the future. They need to invest today in active safety technology, uh, new technologies for uh, cars as this kind of technology really becomes more common in the automotive industry. So next I'm going to hand it off to Peter. He's going to go through our uh, qualitative analysis and so um, for the qualitative analysis, we um, do a SWOT analysis on, on Nissan taking over the fulfillment or uh, still sticking with all the with the um, DC in all the branch. So uh, for the strength for um, Nissan taking over uh, fulfillment would be uh, more fl flexibility for them because uh, they can also they can reduce the waste in uh, all the transit time um, through the DC and they'll be uh, taking on more controls. But the weakness was that um, they would have to invest a lot of money on the toads because right now Nissan has 100 toads. Um, so if they want to uh, do all the fulfillment by themselves, they would have to invest a lot of money to buy more toads to uh, meet the demand. Also, um, they will take over the risk on uh, shipping. So that once they pick up the shipment and often they will be liable for their own shipments. And also, they of course, they'll be carrying uh, more inventories, um, increase their safety stock. And which costs up more lead time. So uh, about the opportunities that right now Nissan does not have enough volume to make um, its own fulfillment uh, cost effective. So uh, with the three percent yearly growth in auto industry, uh, hopefully uh, Nissan will meet um, to make the entire process more cost effective to uh, find the golden nuggets in the supply chain. But threat is like the drug shortage uh, right now. Uh, according to American Trucking Association, uh, uh, there this shortage of 45,000 truckers uh, throughout the states. Uh, so there, there's a difficulty for finding new truckers. Also, uh, increasing in the transportation costs. Also, going through uh, I-80 Wyoming during the winter. We all know uh, Wyoming is not fun during winter. All the winds and the snow. Uh, so that would in, uh, increase the risk of uh, passing through Wyoming. So uh, if Nissan stick with uh, auto lift uh, with the throughout the cross deck, the string will stop. So uh, auto lift to do the mix loads. So that would optimize the cargo use and minimize the cost. 
uh, to create a lean supply chain. Also, they do milk runs. They can stop at multiple facilities to pick up the containers and do uh, different drop-offs. But the weakness is that Nissan wants, to, uh, wants a change, but if we don't um, like meet um, their, um, what's that, uh, the requirement or desire, um, that might hurt the relationship between Autoliv and Nissan. Also, um, also the distance from often to uh, all the branch is also a problem. And then now the overcapacity, because uh, since the um, Takata uh, airbag company they went bankrupt last year, so uh, all of them will be taking over the market share. So right now, often uh, it's all already over um, capacities. So there's uh, an issue that we need to address as well. So uh, the opportunities for uh, using the cross stop in uh, Mississippi would be. Uh, we can also take up the market shares in the region uh, from Takata. And the threats would be also the driver shortage, also the weather and rising in the transportation costs. Also, um, key safety, I uh, just uh, made a acquisition of Takata with for 1.6 billion. So uh, if um, auto lift does not increase its capacity, uh, they might lose a uh, competitive advantage um, with for, uh, in the auto uh, safety industry. So now I'll pass uh, to Joaquin to talk more about the quantitative analysis. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. So uh, first, we're just going to disclose some of the assumptions that we made while we were doing our calculations. Uh, the first one is we assumed that transit costs are going to remain constant for four years. Uh, we assumed that Nissan will receive similar shipping rates through CR England that um, the auto leave is currently receiving. We assumed that the totes purchased by Nissan will not be bro uh, broken or lost. We assumed that drivers will meet their maximum allotted driving <coughs> time and they will take the most direct routes. We assume that auto leave uh, absorbs the loading and unloading costs at Ogden like they already are. And we assumed that forecasted sales for auto industry are reliable, um, the ones we were getting in the case. So getting right into it, uh, here we have a uh, analysis of um, the rate per mile. So to get that, we took the given rate uh, one way from Ogden to the Olive Branch uh, crosstalk facility that's already uh, being implemented. We calculated the mileage uh, of that voyage, and we took the uh, one-way rate divided by the mileage to get a rate per mile. We then took that rate per mile, multiplied it by the miles for the journey direct from Ogden to the different manufacturing plants of Nissan to get a total round trip cost for the Ogden to Smyrna uh, voyage and the Ogden to Canton voyage. So then next we took this chart cost um, and then using the equation we were given in the Excel document provided to us, we projected the Nissan freight cost per part. Uh, this equation was the chart cost divided by the standard pack times the adjusted Q based off of weight. Um, so then that gave us our price for uh, or our freight cost per product or per part and we multiplied that times the volume in order to get yearly totals for each of the different models of the um, Nissan products and then we added all of those to get our yearly total for the freight cost of the projected sales. All right, so this slide shows Nissan's largest investment that they would have to make in order to make their direct fulfillment happen, and that's the purchasing of the totes that are used to carry uh, the finished product from Ogden uh, to wherever it's going. Right now, they only have about 100 totes that they use for their shorter journey, uh, but in order to do this uh, you know, long trip, they would have to purchase a lot of these totes. And so these are our calculations for this. Uh, we figured that their, their loop for their entire process was about 20 days, so we uh, figured out how many 20-day periods there are in a year to figure out how many containers that they would need, and then it was just as simple as multiplying how many containers they would need by the cost of uh, those specific containers, and uh, it comes right out under $3 million for that initial investment, but what's nice is they don't have to pay for that every single year, it's just uh, every four years as the totes uh, wear out. Um, so it was mentioned in the case that Nissan has a 20% uh, cost of capital. So we need to make sure that this investment of the uh, totes 
was a viable option for Nissan. So to do that, we just did a simple internal rate of return calculation. This was a calculator uh, software online. We entered our initial investment of the totes, uh, the number you saw in the previous slide. We have our uh, the cost of freight uh, that we calculated in the previous slide as well. And then this cash in is going to be money saved uh, that we will discuss in the following slide. As you can see here at the bottom, 24% is our internal rate of return. That's over 20%, so therefore this uh, investment by Nissan would be viable for their 20% cost of return. All right, and this is for their savings to Nissan. So if they took over their own fulfillment, they would lose the cost of having to have their freight handled through that Memphis Crosstalk facility, as well as uh, the cost uh, that auto leave incurs from shipping it, so we found this uh, by multiplying the volume by the cost of the part, and that gave us, uh, through the crosswalk facility, and that gave us that MPS cost save figure, uh, which we just went down through every product. Same with that projected freight cost per part. That's the, the cost that AutoLeave uh, passes on to Nissan to ship that long-term uh, that long journey from Ogden to the cross stop. So these would be costs that Nissan would no longer have to pay since they're handling their own fulfillment. And that goes directly to their bottom line, so it's a big savings for them. So here to just kind of summarize all the numbers we've um, seen. The top is the current um, fulfillment strategy. We have the NPS cost, which mainly consists of the unloading and touches at the uh, crosswalk facility. We have the freight cost, which is just shipping and transit costs. The subtotal at the end there. And then below this is the Nissan fulfillment strategy. So we have our tow um, cost, or our initial investment here. We have our freight cost if Nissan takes over. Uh, at, uh, over there you can see the total year one cost is going to be higher than the subtotal, which would represent the yearly cost for the freight. So as you can see, year one we would actually be losing, we would be negative. Um, just because of that initial investment. But as you can see, the following years, we would be saving um, 1.2 million, which would total out to 1.9 million over that four year period. And now I'll just pass it off to Peter to uh, tell us our or tell you our recommendation. Thank you. So um, for our recommendation for the capacity at the Ogden plant, so since Toyota and Bethesda, they will open a uh, joint plant in Huntsville, uh, Alabama in 2021, and they're looking at to produce about uh, 300,000 cars a year. So that's a lot of demand for airbags in four years. So um, an auto lift, uh, often they're already at the red zone, so they're over, already over capacity, so they, they need to expand, uh, expand their uh, plan to meet the demand. So um, for our recommendation for the OLED branch, so uh, we, um, so since the, the contract would be due in four years, so uh, we recommend to uh, look for a new um, location for uh, the, the DC. So uh, the location we picked is the Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, it's a prime location. Um, it has uh, Interstate 24 that serves West Tennessee region and Interstate 75 that serves East Tennessee and Georgia region. Also, uh, Interstate 59 to serve Alabama and Mississippi region. So uh, it has like uh, right now it has seven uh, plants around that region. Also, the two new one. As you can see, um, here's the map of the um, auto manufacturers around um, Chattanooga. So the star set is where uh, Chattanooga is located. So it's uh, the center of the, all the uh, auto manufacturers. Also, uh, of, of course, we're going to have a contingency plan. So the first option we consider is the air freight. So uh, we look at that, we get a quote from uh, UPS. Uh, we're looking at uh, $5.50, uh, 15 cents per pound. So it is really expensive. So uh, we do not consider this as our primary uh, contingency plan. So, uh, so uh, for the alternative routing options, we'll forecast the weather, see uh, if the road's close in Wyoming, uh, we might have to go down to Salt Lake City to take I-70 instead. And um, so also I'm going to carry more even uh, safe, safety stock, so uh, it'll be around 3 to 5% depends on the season, so in the winters we'll be carrying more um, safety stock because 
the roads uh, are more um, tough during um, you know the winter times. I close all the time in Wyoming, we walk all the way. So the truck drivers they do not want to go through Wyoming during the winter. Now I'll pass to Julian to wrap it up. So we wanted to come with a recommendation of if it was a perfect world and maybe all of you could start over, how it would look. And we recommend that they move their manufacturing closer to customers. Obviously there's a lot of history in Utah, but just seeing how far away they are from their customers, it does have some problems. So we recommend the Midwest or Southeast would be a prime location for that manufacturing. Also, we recommend that Auto Leaf um, R&D, which is currently located in Southern California, um, relocate close to customers R&D as well. This will just provide harmony, communication, um, and just make things a lot easier. And then finally, um, we would recommend that Auto Leaf listen to dual fulfillment options because it fosters trust. Auto Leaf will lose risk, but in addition, Nissan and other automotive um, companies can find the golden nuggets and have more control. So we wanted to just propose a timeline of what it may look like in the future for AutoLeaf and Nissan. So initial, initially, um, obviously hold the Nissan makes a bet, and AutoLeaf can give this recommendation to Nissan. Then AutoLeaf can look into expanding the active safety research, which as we said before is an emerging market, so it's something that we believe money should be invested into. Next, um, the AutoLeaf Ogden factory renovation. Expanding the warehouse, maybe making it a bigger um, they were warehouse that the overcapacity isn't really a problem. We would see that in the near future. Um, two years down the line, a Nissan Kaizen reevaluation. So this would just be, it would be similar to the Thanks event. Just look over what um, has gone on, maybe what changes need to be made. Next would be the auto leave. Auto leave begins search for a new location. We do believe that this is important um, as the industry grows, especially with the two new, uh, with the two Toyota and Mazda plants opening. We do believe that this is important. And finally, in four years, um, AutoLeaf opening the new location, would be, this would be a prime time to open a new location. Um, and then Nissan reevaluate the fulfillment operations. And of course, during this whole time, we do recommend, as AutoLeaf already is implementing the zero defects, just continuing to make the processes more efficient and looking into more research to ensure those zero defects happen. So because of the hard work that AutoLeaf has put in, Colleen was able to watch her son play his first her son played his first college baseball game, her daughter played her junior year of softball, her youngest son played freshman basketball, and continue her passion of rescuing girls from the life of human trafficking. We'd like to open up for questions now. <clears throat> I, I got a question. Um, I think it was your second slide to talk about um, the position that you wanted to take uh, you said that Nissan can afford this, right? So uh, that was. So oh, no, that's okay. So if 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 Nissan can afford the risk, why would they want to afford the risk? I guess that's my question. We see it from their point of view that they would get direct control over their their whole fulfillment operation, so they can you know run wild and find all sorts of more efficient processes, and it kind of takes. We figured it was a win-win because AutoLeaf loses the risk. They're not, you know, looking at losing four trucks a year on I-80 in Wyoming, and Nissan also gets the win because they get to make it more efficient if they can, and it's in their hands essentially. From what we understood from the case, that's what they wanted. Certainly more visibility too if they take over that aspect of the uh, fulfillment. In that scenario, though. <clears throat> Uh, the touches that are reduced by AutoLeaf are now picked up by Nissan, at least to some degree. Um, why is this attractive to Nissan? They're trying to uh, go after that golden nugget and, and uh, reduce their costs. Why would they want to absorb those costs? Uh, they're, they're losing touches because they would be going direct from Ogden to their facilities in Canton and Smyrna. They're not gaining those touches from going through the cross facility. So they would be absorbing the transportation costs, but through our analysis, we saw that it was within their 20%. Could you offset that with the cost of carry inventory? Obviously, they're going to have them a higher safety stock and a higher inventory at their facility, at both facilities, respectively, in order to account for reduction touches and leaving the cross buck? Right, yeah. Um, we didn't quite. Uh, find enough information on Nissan to be able to uh, 
uh, we felt that we weren't able to get an accurate calculation of um, maybe the cost of carrying that inventory. I think that is definitely something important to consider that, yeah, they are going to have to carry more inventory because of the distance and the, the lead times. Uh, but we felt that it would not impact enough in order to offset the savings that they would be receiving. That's what I had a slide that was called disclosed assumptions. We thought that yeah, of course. So um, the top four, right, top three mm -hmm. assumptions here are, uh, I guess, I understand why you took the assumptions, but those are real world things that happen every day. Transit costs do not remain the same. Yeah. So as diesel fuel changes up or down, there's going to be uh, changes in the, in the cost of transportation. Um, Nissan probably could get better rates than auto mechanics. I mean, they just have better purchasing power, right? So um, you have to look at things of that nature. And then no totes purchased by Nissan will be broken or lost. Um, that just, yeah. there's just when we no did our that can happen. Yeah, yeah, so, of course. When we did our calculation, we did try to be conservative with our numbers. We did plan for extra totes, um, but we also, you know, planned that there wouldn't be a, a detrimental loss of, of totes and things like that. We, we did try to be conservative with our, our calculations. So, and, and in this, um, so the FOB point now shifts, obviously, to Ogden and, and Nissan takes control and responsibility of that freight. So that, that fourth bullet there that talks about drivers taking maximum amount of driving time and those direct routes. In the event that there's an accident or weather delays, um, which can sometimes last for more than 24 to 48 hours, it may result in uh, air freight on yes. or Nissan to keep their manufacturing plant ready. Did you take that into consideration? Yeah. In calculations? Uh, yeah, we did do some calculations on that. Um, we really would like to avoid the air freight if at all possible, obviously. Like you said, the real world isn't always very perfect. We calculated that that would be, um, according to UPS, um, their rates uh, from this Ogden to the um, manufacturing there, it's that 515 um, per pound, uh, at 2,000 pounds or more, which our shipments were, for a 40,000 pound uh, shipment. Uh, one truck, essentially, uh, we're looking at 200, or uh, just over 200,000 dollars. So, was there any budget or any type of deduction taken out of the Nissan uh, cost savings model uh, for the event that we're doing any type of premium freight or air freight shipments? Uh, we didn't in our calculations. Um, we could certainly look into doing that. We do have that number that we could. So the cost, the cost, the Nissan saving. Um, Figure five here. Um, so year one, they're losing money, right, because of the initial investment. Yes, year two, three, and four, uh, are they making 1.2 million per that year? That would be savings, yeah. Um, so yeah, so their total be, four year savings would be the 1.2 million. Uh, the sum of the numbers are concerned, sir. In your, uh, in your contingency slide, you have the uh, listed <coughs> both an alternate route and carry three to five percent safety stop. Uh, two things, using an alternative route um, to avoid the weather you mentioned uh, is going to significantly change uh, the cost of your transportation, which is going to go back to your previous slide, um, the savings that this would, would uh, recover, uh, as well as that, that carrying cost. You, you mentioned that you had calculated what, what these um, carrying costs are going to be. Um, that's that. Do you believe that three to five percent safety stock is an adequate safety stock um, based on uh, the risk analysis? Yeah, we felt like um, certainly in the summer um, and the some of the nicer months, I suppose, um, the the risk of losing trucks would be less than say the winter months. So we did try to adjust for that by carrying more uh, safety stock seasonally. Um, so that's where we have that range of 3 to 5 or not, 3 to 5 percent. Also, um, we will implement the dual fulfillment method. So, um, so Nissan will be carrying in um, their uh, regular inventory stuff. So if they need, is there any emergency coming up, they can always go to the, um, the DC to get um, supplies from um, 
like the from the Mississippi uh, DC. So they would they would be doing pickups in Auburn, Utah, and also in Memphis, Tennessee, and Colorado. Yeah, the idea is that uh, if they have a full load of trucks, they can always uh, send their own trucks here. But if they only have like a uh, twenty percent or thirty percent, they can also do the mix load through the DC. So would only own the inventory at both locations? Mm, I believe in the model. I'm sorry, could you So would Autoleaf you? have to make sure that they have shipments available to send to Nissan at both the Ogden and um, Olive Branch locations? Correct. So we're thinking that um, the majority or the bulk of their um, shipments could be uh, direct since we saw the savings there. Um, but as a contingency, as a way to try to reduce you know, some of that risk that you had allotted to earlier, having to do with them might be a way. How does that account for packaging costs? Because now you're having potentially inventory that's going to sit at that Olive Branch location in packaging and tie it up for an extended period of time, especially if you're always getting a full truckload coming out of Auburn. This is just the contingency backup plan to avoid potentially some of that air freight. Um, how, how did you account for that inventory that might be sitting there stagnant for a period of time, tying them packaging, that they can invest in it? Right. That would certainly be a cost algorithm um, that would be something that we would need to calculate with Auto Lead, you know, whether they charge that to Nissan or some other way of accounting for that, that cost, right? Uh, we also identified that the Auto Lead facility we feel isn't adequate um, to handle some of that extra stock, so that's why we recommended an expansion so that there is more room for that, and hopefully that inventory can uh, cost less I guess, in that. In that. Where's your, uh, you talk about this expansion, um, okay, so where's that capital coming from? Where do you where do you reference that cost of Auto Lead? Because that's going to be a, a net cost against the bottom line. Well, I guess the way we see it, if there's, if our case is correct, and there's 3% growth in the auto industry, Auto Lead is going to have an increasing amount of business, more airbags to make. Uh, I think that we see that the cost of expanding some of their facilities is going to be worth it, scaling with the increasing capacity that they're facing. So why would I invest in expanding my workhouse in Ogden, Utah, to turn around in two years, go to a new facility? Exactly. That's definitely right. a consideration. In a perfect world, it would be great if you could pick up and, you know, move somewhere that doesn't have to deal with the Wyoming roads, doesn't have to deal with the weather. That would be that would be great. I think in the, the meantime, maybe even a little bit of an expansion or a remodel would be beneficial, um, especially if moving it was not an option in your four-year plan. I think it's also important to note that the timeline there, uh, four years is a really critical point for both Auto Leaf and Nissan in our, in our plan here, because the way it works, incidentally, uh, Auto Leaf's uh, lease for their current location um, at the MPS is up in four years, and that would be when Nissan would need to uh, either renew their toads, buy new toads because of their four-year lifespan, or look at different fulfillment options. So it is a clean slate of sorts. What was the uh, what's what, what's your guys' determination on uh, routing that Nissan would take uh, flowing through Utah? Are they going to send a uh, truck in every day, two trucks a day, once a week? Um, um, we do not know the demand for each month. So we just keep aware even the annual um, amount they they require. So uh, we do not know how many trucks we need to send. Right. We did calculate the um, 20 day period for the turnaround for the toads. So I think based off of that um, 20 day, we can probably calculate uh, the frequency of trucks and things like that. Uh, to you know, the reason I, I'm bringing up this question is. is the, the trucks currently in, in, in this example are cubed out very efficiently, mm -hmm. efficiently with, a, with a broad mix of product right. and OEMs and things of that nature. So everything moving from Ogden to Olive Branch, are, the, those, that truck is very utilized, mm -hmm. right? We don't know, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you guys don't know how utilized those trucks are going to be for Nissan coming in. Pick up modeling, right? right? So the the packaging plan that you you built, mm -hmm. um, 
how do you know that's going to be the right amount of packaging? How do you know that's going to be the right number of investment when you don't know the frequency and the trucks going to be Right. Well, so we did use an average, as you as you pointed out, um, and we felt that was a good estimation. But you're right that we would need to further analyze the, and, and optimize those loads. Um, so that would probably be somewhere in that two-year um, reevaluation, where possibly Nissan could come in and say, you know, this is working and this isn't working, to look for some more of those cost savings, or where we are spending too much in our plan. All right, uh, that's all the time we have for questions.